tulips like sun. Try and give them a protected site as well, somewhere away from those winds. Free draining soil. That's what the tulips really like. In a pot, free draining, John Innes, add some grit, add some sand, add some osmocote as well. Slow release fertilizer. Yeah, slow release fertilizer. And when you're watering them in their growing season, definitely give them more feed. This is another this is Clusiana nice Catherine's got. And this is Bar Chrysantha, so it's yellow the sort of orange markings to the outer tepals. And again, talking about leaves, they, they're sort of so erect and then they sort of fall down so nicely. So it's a lovely one to grow in a pot. Mm. Hey! Hello and welcome to Talking Dirty, another of our specials talking about East Druston Old Vicarage, that glorious 32 acre garden on the Norfolk coast aforementioned garden we have my fabulous co-presenter alan edward herbert gray our happy and very handsome horticulturalist in many stripes and some squiggles and i'm not entirely sure what but it's navy and white and very smart it's john smedley no it isn't yes it is hello this how are you beaming over in cambridgeshire on what I believe is a somewhat sort of drippy day with you. Oh. Here we don't have any precipitation for the next 60 minutes. So I'm sitting in the dry until I've finished with you and then I go outside and get wet. Hey ho, such is life. Yes, we've not timed this especially well. Alan's all tucked up <laughs> when he doesn't need to be. Mind you, I mean, I'm sure there's plenty of potting shed type activities that we'll talk about in just a moment as we get properly stuck into all the yep. glorious things going on in the garden. But I must say a massive thank you to everyone who tuned in to our first forays back into the world of gardening radio. Um, it, we're recording this a few days after our first programme back on your BBC local radio. If you happen to be based in Norfolk, Suffolk, and Cambridgeshire then it's on Sunday on your kind of FM DAB all of that between 11 and 1 every Sunday with Alan myself and a glittering array of gardeners from across East Anglia but if you happen to be abroad or in any other part of the UK then it's all on BBC Sounds and I've popped a link in my Instagram profile so if you go to Thunder Fairy on Instagram then you can just click and there are various different links, but one of them is Sunday show. And then you can fast forward the first hour if you wish and get into the gardening phone in between 11 and 1. Not just a phone in, of course, lots of general gardening chat. Um, and you can send in questions. And oh, it was just so much fun, Alan. It was wonderful to be reunited. <laughs> well, it really was because it, it's like sort of, um, you know, suddenly you're back in your little safety bubble. We had Ian Roof with us. And of course, the inimitable Joe from um, Monk Silver Nursery, who's a, a fount of knowledge, as as is Ian. Both of them are in actual fact. Um, and I just felt so lovely to be in that uh, in that bubble with you all. I just uh, and I tell you what amazed me. And it was the sheer number of people that got in touch. I don't know how people knew. But we had people arriving in the car park here saying to Graham in, on the car park, you know, we've just been listening to Alan. We're so glad they're back. Um, and, you know, and other people in the garden coming up and saying, somebody told me you've been on the radio. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we didn't know. So, you know, we think it was busy this Sunday, but in, in coming Sundays, it could be even busier once people get to know where we are and get to find us. We could do with... We could do with them as many of you as possible because there, there's um, there's a, a little bit of a jostle, not a jostle, but we, we've got to play some music and um, we would all rather just talk about gardening. This is, you know, I'm probably not supposed to say this. So don't tell any BBC bosses. But uh, the more of you that listen, the more likely it is that we can prove gardening content is what people are after. So please tune in. Yeah. And you can also just find it on the BBC Radio Cambridgeshire, Norfolk and Suffolk schedules, you know, online if you want to listen again. And and because, you know, we always found this with gardening radio, a bit like podcasting. You sometimes want to listen to it when it works for you, not when it's on the radio. So you can, you know, send a question in by email. We've got an email set up, gardenparty at bbc.co.uk. And then you just listen back at your leisure. And fingers crossed, we do our very best to fit all the questions in. It's well, it proved tricky in the first one. It may prove trickier going forward, but we will do our absolute best to answer your question. So you can listen at your leisure on a rainy evening when you're not busy in the garden and just enjoy some gardening chat and hopefully get your horticultural conundrum figured out by the experts. I can't wait. And you get a little bit you get a little bit of fun in there too when we get tongue-tied and yeah. things like that. 
And I was just going to say the other thing is to everybody listening to this podcast, please tell your friends and acquaintances about us because, you know, the more listeners we have, the better it is for everybody. And always remember that no question is too silly because, um, you know, there was a lady came to the garden here once and she wanted um, she wanted to, uh, a plant, a particular plant, but she didn't know how to say it. And so she said, I want an, an, um, 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 an abutilon. And I said, I think you mean a butylon. But I said, I understood you. So that's all that matters. Don't feel embarrassed by it, for goodness sake, because, you know, we all have to get used to the way things are pronounced. And I still, well, Ian says to me quite frequently, Ian Roof says to me quite frequently, you are perverse. Because if I say clematis, you will say clematis. <laughs> you know, if I say hemor hemorocalis, you say hemorocalis. It's, <laughs> and I, I do it deliberately. coming on. <laughs> yeah, I do <laughs> I do it deliberately because it's done to try and make people feel that there is no absolute correct way of doing it as long as we understand each other. That's the most important thing. And I can trot out one of my favourite quotes that I've almost certainly used on this podcast before, which is, you should never make fun of somebody, somebody for how they say something if they say it wrong because they almost certainly learned it from reading. And we should never make fun yes. of people for reading. Uh, so if you've only come across a name in a gardening book, how on earth are you ever supposed to know? And none of us really know. We're just following the crowd anyway. It's mostly Latin. And who's got a clue about that? Sadly, no Romans alive to tell us. <laughs> <laughs> now, on with the plants. Onwards with what's going on at East Ruston Old Vicarage. Last time on this podcast, we had a species tulip special, thanks to the Cambridge University Botanic Garden. I thoroughly enjoyed that. And I'm sure East Ruston resplendent with many a lovely tulip species hybrid. I suppose a lot of the a lot of the species one's gone over, but you always have tons of tulips. Yeah, I mean, I do have tons of tulips. And I think that um, also um, just to touch on what you said there, refer I've referenced to, to it while, I'm, while it's fresh in my mind. Um, hybrid tulips, there's masses of those and they are big and blousy and bold and brassy and all of those kind of things. And I have to say that my immediate feeling after having done a job, which I'll tell you about in a minute, um, this weekend is th that I will go over to using species tulips more, um, possibly not in pots and big containers because they're the kind of things that, you know, that's where you use tulips. You take them out when they're finished flowering. What you do with them after the after that is up to you. But, you know, basically these big hybrid bulbs are beefed up and by the bulb growers um, to make them big and give a big flower the first year. And then unless we really know how to treat them uh, to build them up again, we they probably diminish a little bit. And, and hy uh, hybrid tulips do eventually sort of fade out. Although having said that, there's a little, little... I've forgotten what they're called now, but they've got crinkly edges, these tulips, and there is a name for the for the, for the, the type. Um, there's a, a group of about five of them in the front of, of the front courtyard here, and they've been there about seven years, and they keep getting spades put through them when I'm digging, but they still persist. So how how perverse is that? <laughs> but no, I, I think I think in the garden in general, I shall go over more to using species tulips, and I think with diligence and research. You can find them from the very, very early ones, and they do start flowering as early as February. Mm. Although, you know, the weather is a bit rough then, probably, to have them. But March, April, and into May, and we know the latest flowers to flower, the latest tulips to flower, don't we, thought this? Sprangerai. Sprangerai. That's the one, yeah. It's absolutely an, a, a, a wonderful tulip. We've said enough about that, so let's cut the, cut, cut the yeah. cackle on that. But what I was cut. doing, I was... We've, we've talked a lot about bulb planting um, in the autumn and we have talking about lasagna planting in layers um, of various varieties and various types of bulbs. Um, and I don't do a huge amount of layering, but probably two or three. And the two are hyacinths in the top layer um, because they tend to flower first and then a tulip below that and another tulip below that and sometimes another tulip below that if the container is big enough. And I tend to want my tulips to slightly overlap. So I do an early, a medium flowering and a late flowering because that increases the length of season from two weeks to six weeks, shall we say. Um, but anyway, I was going through my tulips as they're just changing colour and they were spoiled. The pots looked a mess. Why? Because the hyacinths had gone over and they'd gone brown and they'd gone horrible. And it's not a nice job because hyacinths, the sap that comes from hyacinths and the, the texture of their blooms, and they've got sodden wet in recent days and, and started to rot a little bit and it makes them all sticky. <laughs> so you really want a pair of uh, gloves on to do the job. 
Anyway, took all the hyacinth heads off, and the lady came into the garden who works in the in the tea room here, um, and she came in on Sunday and she said to me, "You changed your pots." I said, "Have I?" She said, "Yes. You filled them full of tulips. They had hyacinths in last week." And I said, "Well, I haven't really changed them. I've just removed the dead flowers." Well, how is that? So I then had to explain what lasagna uh, planting means, um, and. You know, that's just the way it is. But it does pay if you've got containers like that, like that, to remove the dead flowers off the first ones that go over because it mars the display thereafter. So that's what I was doing. I know that you sometimes will buy in a general mix of tulips to do a mass planting, but are there specific varieties that you've been going for that you've been impressed by in your displays this year? Um, I'll tell you the one display that I have been um, impressed by is... Um, Parker's Dutch Bulbs or Parker's, Parker's Wholesale. Um, anybody can buy from them, by the way, if you're, if you're, if you're wondering about that. Um, and you can buy in multiples of 10. And if you buy 100, it's much cheaper. And if you buy 1,000, it's even cheaper, although it's more expensive pro rata. But, but you know, um, anyway, they're red mix. I was absolutely thrilled with it. It's, uh, it's a mixture of reds, pinks, plummy colours. And if you really want to be... Um, shall we say, outstandingly naughty, you can take their red mix and, and you, you will get a picture in their catalogue or online, you'll get a picture of what the red mix look like, looks like and it is absolutely as it should look because I've got a whole border of them up here at here in East Russ and where the dahlias are in the summer. Um, you can actually add then your own colour. You can add a black tulip if you wish or something like that or you can add a white one or you can add a green one. You know, you can add whatever you like. Um, I wouldn't add yellow, but then if you want to, why not? <laughs> your choice why is not yours. Your garden. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, it doesn't seem to be quite as bad with you as it is with me, but definitely a day to be holed up in the potting shed if you were in Cambridgeshire. And you have been spending, as you always are, a lot of time propagating, cutting seeds. What have you been up to on that front at East Ruston? Well, I've been sowing an awful lot of seeds. I sowed, I think, probably 12 um, uh, Twelve trays of seed yesterday and they were seed that I'd found from previous years now I don't know whether they're going to be viable or not but I have kept them cool and kept them dark and kept them safe so hopefully they will be but you know if they're not it doesn't really matter I've been saving some more recent uh, sowing some more recently bought seed this morning of a, a tall growing um, purple amaranthus which is a relative of love lies bleeding if people know that um, and lots of these amaranthus are grown as food crops in South America and it's from South America that they've come across to be probably first used in the cut flower industry because, you know, they've got long stems with lots of side shoots and these feathery blossoms and they're in shades of green and pale pink, dark red, plum and biscuit. There's one called Hot Biscuits, which I love, and it looks like the colour of a ginger biscuit, you know, that rich rufous colour. Um, and they're terribly useful as, as um, dot plants and for fillers in the garden. And the ones I'm so I've been sowing grow more than a metre tall, probably a metre, metre and a half, something like that. So, you know, six, seven feet, shall we say. Um, so they you can be put at the back and they can be used all everywhere throughout the garden. Um, and they're very useful things. The observant and very unobservant among you may have noticed that uh, we've had a little change of scenery for Alan. So uh, the Internet <laughs> fell over. He's... Um, if you're lucky watching the video version, he has relocated to the office where, fingers crossed, the internet will be on our side. We were right in the middle of talking about the amaranthus you had been sowing um, and and what happens next, I suppose. I mean, I've learned this through trial and error, but, you know, most seedlings, if you don't prick them out, immediately they're ready. They start to go backwards. In other words, they suffer a check in their growth. And sometimes they just don't get over that um, or you don't get as big a plant as you hope you're going to get. Um, but with amaranthus, the reverse is true because they they actually hold in their seed trays very well. And I've learned that, um, you know, I think, oh, gosh, I should prick those out. And two weeks later, I've gone back to the tray and thought, oh, I really must do this. And then I've gone back again a week later and I've done it. And I thought that it's probably too late, but it isn't. They just rump away as soon as they've got the feet into some fresh compost. And quite often what I do with them at that stage is I, I clump prick them out. So I don't prick out the individual seedlings. I prick, prick them out into little clumps of three, five, seven, or whatever, they, however they fall. Um, and, you know, within a four, four weeks, they're ready and big enough to go out in the garden. So 
they're a forgiving plant, but it's a good one to grow. Any amaranthus are, are, are fit for this. They're all good ones to grow for, for filling in later in the season. And as we go through the season, you probably notice that you will find gaps um, in your borders and beds and all the rest of it. And so you will need you'll need fillers. And that's what they're good for. Uh, so this podcast is becoming a little bit like different scene changes uh, and a theatre play or something. Uh, each different chapter of the podcast, we have a slightly different device or setting in Alan's house. But fingers crossed, this one will provide us with strong enough internet to get to the end of the East Rusted Old Vicarage April special. Um, now, we were just talking about seeds. I believe you have been sowing some, well, you said you'd sown some older seeds that you'd found you didn't know about their uh, w- whether they were going to get actually germinate. But um, one of the things you found was it some sort of East Ruston or Vicarage sweet peas? It was. It was an envelope containing a special seed mix from old East Ruston or Vicarage or EROV. <laughs> and I don't know whether these seeds are viable, but I took them down just before lunch and I put water. I leave them in there for 24 hours and just see if they swell up. And if they swell up, I'll sow them. And if they germinate, they do. And if they don't, they, well, the pots go back onto the compost heap. So that's all right. But, but uh, you know, just interesting to see. Um, I think it's always interesting with seeds. If you have them for more than the allotted cent- uh, a length of time of their viability, especially on seed packets, because often today it says so by the end of 2024, for instance. If you, could, what, if you discover them in 2020 them and see because even if you only get four or five at least it's something um and quite often you'd be surprised i think the idea of soaking your sweet peas i've seen people on social media uh saying they can't be bothered to soak their peas i have and i haven't i've never analyzed whether it has any influence but in googling it i have read some people believe certain shades have a kind of harder surface to the seed and require soaking i have no idea whether that's true either but you clearly are soaking yours I've always done it, you see. I think this is one of the things. And I do remember um, uh, several years ago reading that um, Sarah Raven no longer uh, soaks her sweet peas. And, you know, she dismissed it as being completely unnecessary, which it might be. <clears throat> but it's always worked for me. And I think that's probably why I still do it. <laughs> but do bear, do bear in mind that if you're sowing an, uh, seeds or if you're planting a corm such as anemones, and you know when you get an anemone corm out of the packet that it arrives, horrible little thing you can't tell whether it's top or bottom Martha or Martha you know it just you can't tell anything about it at all and so you get this thing and it just looks like it looks like something that the dog has done and it's shriveled up <laughs> it's really quite imp- repulsive but if you soak them for 24 hours they come out of the soak as being all plumped up and smooth skinned and everything else and I did it with some very dark flowered anemones which are just about the flower um it's the coronaria type one that has the Beaujolais coloured, bur- purpley, maroony coloured outside and a blue middle, which oh. is so beguiling. Looks lovely. I love those. So I think, I think it's worthwhile soaking something because if you don't, if you plant an anemone, for instance, as a sweet pea seedling, it will take time for the moisture to penetrate that outer coating. And so what you're doing by soaking your sweet pea seeds or your anemone corms is you're rushing that little bit. Uh, talking of uh, of exciting seeds in envelopes, I was up the allotment seeing what might have started to germinate from things I have been sowing, you know, last autumn. And there's been a tiny bit of sowing this spring. I mean, too early, but if I've got a lot of seed of something and I've got some fleece, I've been having a go with some salad. So I had some dill germinate, but then the dog leapt all over it for some unknown reason. So that's had a bit of a battering. That was not my most successful moment at the allotment. Um but the uh, the most exciting thing is right by the label that says Smyrnium, I think I might have some Smyr- Smyrnium ger- uh, germinating that you sent me in an envelope from East Ruston Old uh, Vicarage last year. But I've never grown it before. So it's just cotyledons at the minute. It's just seed leaves. So I'm waiting for a truly... The cotyledons, <laughs> the cotyledons are long and narrow and very shiny. Oh, it's promising. Fingers crossed. Yeah. It's right by the label. So it, it does seem like it might actually be a Smyrnium, Pavoliatum, glorious, acidy, zingy, spring-like thing. So I've always wanted it. Finally, I might actually get it. It's one of those plants, Smyrnium, Pavoliatum, that's very difficult because <laughs> it's wonderful when it's growing and it's coming into flower. But once it starts to go over, 
People are loath to get rid of it. It's a bit like my mother. You know, I used to take her a bunch of flowers occasionally, and I'd say to her, you know, Mother, those flowers have seen better days. It's time to let them go. And she's, oh, darling, just one more day. And, I mean, they're looking horrible, but... <laughs> That's me. <laughs> you do that. <laughs> well, you know, Smyrna is the same thing. Once it starts to look slightly past its best, and thank goodness they don't do this for the human race, it's best, to, it's, it's best to just get rid of the lot. Um, but do remember to save a few seeds for future generations. <laughs> well, I'm excited. Fingers crossed I'll be able to save my own seed in uh, in future years if it actually grows and flowers and does its thing. Um, other things going on at, uh, at East Ruston Old Vicarage. I believe you have some very nice tropiolums doing their thing under glass. Well, I've got, yes, I've got two. I mean, I've got the wonderful, wonderful Tricolorum, um, which has flowers that, that look a little bit like goldfish or parrots, I suppose, in a funny sort of way. And they're sort of red and they've got um, a bit of yellow on them, little black lips and things like that. Um, but they just scramble up this tiny little vine-like thing, scrambles and scrambles and scrambles, and it would it would probably go up to three three meters if it's got the, the, the stuff to climb up um, support. But mine doesn't do that because I keep it fairly low to, to, so I can move it about. And they're up to probably about a meter, a meter and a bit, um, and they just keep going and going and going and and filling them, you know, filling themselves with flour. I've got another one called Hookeriana, which you very kindly know, named for me. I don't know. Were you reading about it or something? I, I saw it on uh, Emma Crawford's Instagram. Glorious, purpley coloured flowers. I think it comes in yellow yeah, as well. I, I haven't quite dug down into the nitty gritty of the naming. It does, but it's it was given to me as a blue tropiolum. Well, it certainly isn't blue, but I mean, you know, we know this in the world of flowers and plants, that plants, when they're often labelled blue, they're more mauve than they are blue. And this is one of those. So, I mean, if it's variable, I mean, it could be anything. I don't know. Um, and, it, you know, it, there may yet be variations. Um, it, the trouble is with both of these, they don't set seed, but they do make tubers underneath the ground. And, and the thing is to get those tubers up and dry them off as soon as the, fin the top of the plant starts to die down, get the tubers up, dry them off, keep them somewhere cool and dark, and then replant them, probably in about July, late, late July, something like that. And you just wait. And miraculously, these funny little tendrils come out of the soil. They look like wispy little bits of nothing. Um, and, you know, if you've got your supports there, suddenly they start to cling onto the supports and then the leaves start to form and all the rest. It's lovely. But they, they, they are very useful if you've got room under glass at this time of the year. I don't think they need that much heat, if any. Um, I had a friend that used to grow tropelium um, tricolorum in a cold greenhouse and it got to the stage where it'd go over the roof of her greenhouse. And, you know, it looked absolutely lovely. Her house was really an alpine house so because it had no heat in it at all. I have heard the same about Pentaphyllum and uh, the wonderful Jane Ann Walton, who we featured on here, who many of you follow because her yeah. garden is just full of wonderful plants. She was sharing how she keeps meaning to hack back Pentaphyllum because it's basically completely covering everything else that's growing in her cold conservatory. She said there's a plumbago underneath there somewhere. <laughs> And it's just <laughs> underneath this blanket of pentaphyllum. But how anyone could bring themselves to cut back this glorious tropiolum that has the, the I mean, I think pentaphyllum might be my favourite. These like speckle throated green and pink little pixie like flowers. It's absolute magic. It's one of my favourite things. I killed mine because uh, I didn't. I couldn't. Well, I've, I've, you can have another one because I've got them. Um, I grow mine outside, in actual fact, oh. um, here. Um, they don't look as wonderful as Jane Ann's does in her conservatory because that just that little modicum of shelter would makes all the difference. But I've got them on the corner of, of the laundry room, in actual fact, and they're scrambling up and they're scrambling into other climbers. And there's a whole little mass of buds there just waiting to open, little pink buds waiting to open. So we're looking forward to that. But the other thing about them is, of course, pentaphyllum makes tubers and they look like creased old nuts almost nutshells and they gradually sort of creep up to the ground and then they, they, they they're at ground level so when you want to increase increase your stock of pentaphyllum you just root around at ground level and pull some of the old tubers out pop them up and bobs your uncle off you go can't believe more people don't have pentaphyllum in their lives uh, talking of things with interesting flowers, though slightly different interesting, you were posting about a jasmine the other day that was doing quite a oh, snazzy yeah. thing. <laughs> well, it is. And well, it, there's a tale to it, actually, because a friend of mine gave me a plant of jasmine 
um, jasmine polyanthemum, the one that we grow, you know, sold under the wire hoops at Christmas time to give mummy something to put on the table that's scented and white flowers and all the rest of it. Somebody bought me one which has pink buds and pink tinged flowers. And I did, I've just noticed that the one I've got in the house, I have a series of them and I, I, I bring them into the house just, to, just after Christmas and then about every three weeks thereafter as, for as many plants as I have. And the latest one I brought into the house has, you know, clusters of pure white flowers with white outsides and green outsides and clusters of pink flowers with pink outsides and pink blush petals on the inside on the same plant. And I've checked this. There is only one main stem going into the top of the, the soil. So it's obviously sporting. And I presume it's the white one that's sporting the pink flowers. And then somebody has taken the pink, a pink flower cutting, if you like, and, you know, that's how it works. Yeah. It's a bit like pelagoniums. They often do this. You'll have a pink pelagonium and it'll suddenly throw a white flowered shoot or red foot. Or red, and it does the same. It, it's sporting. Yeah, and does the rose iceberg do this? I seem to remember from when I was little, my mum had a, a white iceberg, David, a David Austin rose, I think it might be, uh, in her garden. And um, and every so often no, it would I, throw a I pink one. I think iceberg came from... Peter Beals? I think iceberg. Um, no, I think it came from Le Grais. Oh, Le Grice. Oh, that would make sense. Norfolk, Le Grice, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's not, I'm not a big white uh, white flower person, really, so I've never looked it up or been interested in buying it again. <laughs> but I do have this strong memory of being young, and every so often Iceberg would just have a pink rose. Um, and I don't know if, if that was... To... Well, the other, thing, the other thing is you might be aware, mightn't have been aware of then was the fact that Iceberg flowers, as they age, take on a pink tinge. Ah. Maybe it was that. It was a so, long time ago. <laughs> I don't care. Well, so talking, of, talking of roses, I've just planted two plants of the generous gardener. Oh, yes. It's a rose. That's, that is a David Austin rose. And it's, it's one that I've been meaning to grow for many, many years. Um, and I just, uh, I had it for my birthday. So I thought, well, this is lovely. You know, we'll get this in the ground and get it going. I saw it in a, a, a friend's garden and it just bowled me over. I thought, absolutely lovely because she is a very fastidious gardener and it was immaculate. There were no holes in the leaves and the leaves were shiny and light reflecting and it was wonderful. It, it was groomed to perfection. No pests, no diseases. Um, whether it looked like that here or not, I don't know. <laughs> it's interesting, the gardens are fastidious people. My, well, she's not my mother-in-law, but you know, uh, she, her garden is much more park-like than any garden I would ever have. I mean, it's a lot bigger than mine, for starters, but, you know, just really nice crisp beds, and she's got a glorious display of the, the lovely perennials, Darwin tulips, and uh, lots of, you know, pyracantha against the fence that's got a lovely glossy background, and colourful berries in autumn and all of that. And she is very organised, much more organised than me. Uh, and because her garden's long, the end of it is a kind of veg patch. And it's uh, there's also a hospital bed. So anytime she spots that her daffodils or tulips need a bit of extra TLC, she digs them up, pops them in a well-fed hospital bed, and they recuperate. And then she puts them back into the garden. Just such organisation. I will never be like that. There's something else I would say to that, and that is life's too short to stuff mushrooms. Oh, but the satisfaction <laughs> to nurse them back to health. It's, it reminded me of like when you're a child and you have teddy bear hospital or something and you <laughs> nurse your, your we, dollies back. We used to have chicken hospitals oh. when I was a child because we had chickens on the farm and, you know, quite often they'd get a big, big bunion on their feet or something. And we used to put them in. They didn't need to be in hospital at all because they're perfectly all right. It was just that they got old. Oh. Um, but we used to try, we, we used to convince ourselves we were nursing them back to health. Whether it ever worked or not, I don't know. <laughs> I always love insight into young Alan Gray. I would have loved to have uh, to have met you in your in your. Can you imagine? I bet you were such a little imp. I really do. <laughs> There's something else we wanted to talk no. about. You're um, a butylon, a butylon vitifolium. A, but a butylon vit vitifolium. Well, there there are various name clones of this. Um, there's a white form and a very dark purple form. Um, but a, a beauty and long pitifolum, a few things that people should know about. First of all, it is, um, it's a ma member of the Malva family. It's not a long-lived plant, so don't expect to buy one and they will last for 10 years. It might give you five to seven, um, and then you might be all right. But the other thing that I think you need to know about it is immediately it's finished flowering, because it's such a gawky grower, 
you really need to prune it, but don't prune it too hard. So in June, when it's finished flowering, you cut back the stems and leave a little bit of leafage on each stem. Um, and it gives it, it then restores its balance so that it makes it a nice bushy specimen for the following year. Um, and notice I didn't say years, because there might not be years, there might just be a year. <laughs> Um, but it's a, it's a great self-seeding plant, at least in the garden here. I noticed some seedlings this morning of it. And then if you dig them up and pop them, you know, they make perfectly good plants for giving away to friends and everything. But you can't determine the colour. And it's interesting because the one with the white flowers, the name variety with the white flowers, and all those that start off pale mauve, and as the mauve gets darker, the flower gets smaller. So the largest flowers are the palest colours, and then they get smaller and smaller. But they're still very much worth having. And I've got one that's just opening in the front courtyard this morning, which has quite deep flowers. It's, it's a very good plant. Now, I've got to remember to prune it in June. <laughs> Note to self. Um, well, it's been a joy. I must say, one of the real delights about having changed the angle so many times is we're getting a phenomenal view of your ceiling. And what a ceiling <laughs> it is. Well, yeah, that was designed by Graham. And I mean, he loves playing with architectural bits and pieces, as you know. Um, and uh, I don't know whether you can quite see this, but if I swing it round a wee, wee bit, you can probably see um, a cabinet there. And the yes. cabinet's got the same. It's got red silk behind the grills in the doors um, and to match the, the beams in the, on the ceiling there. And um, he designed all this and had the cabinets made and everything else there. So, yeah, it's, it's keeping local per people employed, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, well, and if you're not watching the video version, if you're listening to the audio, it's this phenomenal uh, beamed uh, roof where you've got the beams are painted in, in red and then the, the sort of panelling behind is white and every fifth board is black. So it's all black, white and red and it's <laughs> got a sort of eastern flair about it. It's, it's really fabulous. What we wouldn't expect any of you in, in Graham. He is clever, isn't he? <laughs> Uh, unbelievably yeah. clever. No one person de deserves to be as good as he is, as many things as he is. <laughs> He's in the same room. I, should, I shouldn't say any more. He won't get out of the door. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just make a mention of one thing, and it's Drimmer's Winter Eye. Because Drimmer's Winter Eye, I've told this tale many times, but we're, 45 years ago we were in um, Cornwall and Devon on a holiday, and we bought a plant, or I bought a plant, from Vern Coos and Southdown Nurseries, as it was then, of, of uh, Drimmer's winter eye and the chap said to me when he was get, gathering my plants up and, and toughing up the bill there was there was more than one of course and <laughs> he said to me um where are you from and I said I'm from uh, Norfolk he said well you'll put that back that won't grow in Norfolk and I said well I'll risk it and I risk I risked it and today it's nearly 40 feet tall and it's an evergreen but it is head to toe in this wonderful creamy blossom with little green centers to them um, and, and these then go over to be black berries, which is quite a glamorous shrub, a very, very unusual thing. And it stood up very, very well to the recent gales and high winds that we've had and all the rain that we've had and everything else. And it's just a joy at the moment. Well, I'm very glad you had an aside about Drimus Winfrey, I, uh, because it reminded me that I got so distracted by your ceiling, we nearly didn't flomo. Can you imagine? Not flomo. <laughs> Uh, Flomo, that fear of missing out you get about a flower or a plant. It's what I absolutely live my whole life doing. And I got so excited. I've just dropped my notebook, which I need because um, I don't know this uh, this specific variety name off the top of my head. Uh, it's a monk silver uh, plant. So Joe Sharman. And it's uh, a bluebell. You may or may not know Joe Sharman is is extremely knowledgeable uh, and keen on bluebells and has spent his life spotting various different sort of strains I suppose in woodlands all over the place and anyway he has Hyacinthoides non scripta silver cobalt now this is is kind of reminiscent of the Agapanthus queen mum so you know that kind of white uh, gradienting I suppose if that's a word to blue so it's white at the bottom of the bell and then it, it fades up the wrong word it darkens up blushes blue bluebell blue towards the tip of the the bell and it is absolutely beautiful and it was done wonderful justice by Jane Ann Walton who we already mentioned on Instagram stop me in my tracks glorious glorious plant so that has really given me some serious flomo uh, about you Mr Gray <laughs> mine is much more basic actually and it's it's starting to happen here and it's 
to go back to my Granny Gray's days of, of the polyanthus that she used to grow. Now, when she was alive, she always wanted a blue polyanthus. Alas, she didn't live long enough to ever have one, but she wanted one. And it, it, in those days, a polyanthus that was blue was regarded as rare as hen's teeth, a bit like a blue rose, you know. Um, but anyway, I, I longed for the polyanthus that she used to grow, and they were kind of rusty colours and dark oranges, dirty oranges, dirty reds, um, and all those creamy colours. And they just blended beautifully. This was started by um, a chance drive. I drove through the village one day and I went past somebody's house, don't know who it was, um, and they had a mass of polyanthus in the front garden. They were my grandmother's, Granny Gray's polyanthus. Um, and obviously they, they just, it, it was probably a person of a certain age and they grow them from either themselves own seedlings or they save their own seed and they, and they just keep going and going and going. For some strange reason, we've got one or two plants of that kind of polyanthus growing in the garden here. So I'm going to try and save some seed of those. And the other day when I was going out, we've got primroses along our banks down to the main road along, along the lane. And there's some purple polyanthus along, amongst them. How it got there, I don't know. Uh, some dark red and some orange. Uh, <clears throat> not huge numbers, but, you know, they're gradually coming back. So I've got my seed bank going and I'm thinking, oh, come on, let's hurry up. <laughs> How exciting. <laughs> but polyanthus, um, they are notoriously long in their germination period. I remember when Granny Gray, we used to go to her little greenhouse and each, each day, we, we used to go once a week and we would look to see if a new seedling would come up. And it, once it got big enough, you'd carefully extricate it with an old tea, tea fork, you know, a cake fork, um, and, and from its seed bed and put the seed bed back and wait for further germination. That just remembers one, reminds me of one thing, gardeners are impatient lot, but you know, we have to be patient sometimes, otherwise we don't get any results at all. Yes, plants are there to teach us patience and also to be resourceful with what we use. And there's nothing quite like a kitchen implement in the garden. They're, forks in particular come in very handy. <laughs> <laughs> I've peeled well, the many of them. away. <laughs> well, Alan, it's been a joy as always. I think the sun has actually come out here. There's still a Hooli blowing, but fingers crossed it's coming out for you so that when you leave the podcast and go out into the garden, you don't get precipitation arriving at the wrong moment. Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do, shall I? When we end this podcast, I'm going back to the house and I'm going to sort through the seeds on the dining room table, which I've completely forgotten about. It just shows you how often I go into the dining room, doesn't it? Oh, dear. <laughs> Until there next time, I will get to see you on the radio. I look forward to that already. But until our next podcast, happy gardening, everybody. Happy gardening, everybody. Bye-bye. Hopefully, if I hang up, fingers crossed, you will turn up on my screen any moment. There you are. Oh, no. And you also slightly tilt your laptop lid so that you're nice and centrally located in your picture. That's any better. better? That's better. I'm a bit messy because I've been <coughs> outside in the breeze. Breeze. Breezy. In the breeze. Blowing a hoolie, you might say. Well, we are having a hoolie, actually, at the moment. But it's gone grey and it's a misty drizzle on the wind. Yes, it's horrid. I'm really hoping we don't get any misty drizzle because my mum's about to go outside for a long walk with the baby. <laughs> <laughs> and her hair looks like she's just stepped out of a salon. Yeah, it always does. Yeah, I know it always does. So it does not look rain and wind ready hair. It looks far too nice. I'm feeling very guilty. I lost you. Oh no, I've really lost you. Oh, you're back, you're back, quite quick. Um, I've been saying some amaranthus. Um, some. Oh. oh no. Right, so I'll do another little thing that we can edit across. Fingers crossed this will work for us. <laughs> <laughs>